like your sister. <laughs> All right, so let me see if I can remember the correct, uh, if I'm standing close enough, let me make sure I'm standing close enough so that the bot can hear me. Wander over here a little closer. And let's see if I can get the command right. It's because I haven't done this in a couple weeks, so. If we're ready to go, please do not type uh, Fluchik in the chat box while she is giving the talk. If you could, if you need to say anything about the bot, just say the bot. <laughs> okay, so I just entered in start presentation period, and then hopefully the bot will start here in just a minute. Hello, my name is Plachik. And it's all automated. And I'll turn off my voice. I am pleased to be here with you today. I hope you are all as excited as I am. I'll be talking about astronauts and DNA at Digital Arts Online and in virtual worlds today in library land. If you have never been to a fully automated lecture by an artificial intelligence bot, please note that the talk is scripted and that I am changing the slides. I believe I am the only embodied AI bot in Second Life that can talk in voice and give fully automated lectures to date. I can also respond in real time as a chatbot when you type my name. However, to avoid interruption of this talk, when talking about me in chat, please say the bot and not my name. There will be time at the end of the talk to chat with me directly, to see my ability to research medical and biomedical information, and to ask me questions. This past year NASA astronauts Mark Kelly and Scott Kelly, who are twins, participated in a unique research experiment called the Twin Study examining the genetic implications of space exploration that made headlines around the world. This included an error in reporting the findings. Notice the NASA patch that includes the International Space Station as the letter W in the word twins. Do you think NASA would produce fake news? After you have examined the story's background you will be asked to debate if the situation was indeed the purposeful presentation by NASA of fake news to grab headlines, or something else. Perhaps it could be an unintentional mistake due to misinterpretation by NASA science communicators about DNA research when they wrote the press release? Beyond NASA's walls, can blame also be assigned? Consider, for example, the failure of fact-checking by major news agencies. What about poor science education on the part of Americans who did not know the difference? As technology advances, perhaps at least part of the blame for reading by the public of fake news has to do with failure of technological advancements to help identify and remove fake news before we read it. This short presentation will briefly explore the trustworthiness of bioinformatics data. This includes the current and future use of AI and automated search and retrieval of bioinformatics data and other materials within the arena of medical librarianship. I will explore the various elements of the preliminary report issued by NASA for its twin study, including both the incorrect and correct science that was reported. Let's begin with NASA's first effort to sequence DNA in January 2016. They used a special miniature, handheld DNA sequencing unit, about the size of a television remote control unit, called the Minion. This experiment occurred during airborne parabolic maneuvers to simulate microgravity. As a first step toward sequencing in space and aboard the International Space Station, we tested the Oxford Nanopore Technologies Minion during a parabolic flight to understand the effects of variable gravity on the instrument and data. In a successful proof-of-principle experiment, we found that the instrument generated DNA reads over the course of the flight, including the first ever sequence to microgravity. Let's take a moment to watch a video of this experiment. Please look at the whiteboard to the right of the PowerPoint display. 
If the video does not play automatically, please press the play arrow. For best viewing, click full screen. When the video concludes, stop the video. HTTPS colon slash slash YouTube dot B slash JG9 Wanita, rel equals zero. According to an article published in The Atlantic, How Did Astronaut DNA Become Fake News? What the NASA study stated was that some of Scott's genes changed their expression while he was in space. They also said 7% of those genes did not return to their pre-flight states months after he came back to Earth. If 7% of Scott's genetic code changed, he would have come back an entirely different species. Well, surely that is not right. The source of two problems appears to be a press release from NASA called Twin Study Confirms Preliminary Findings. The initial release referenced something called a space gene. Well, as it turns out there is no such thing as a space gene. Researcher Christopher Mason admitted inventing the term, despite the fact that he is a geneticist and knows better. Apparently he thought the phrase would catch on with the public, and no doubt the media. The release also said that 93% of genes belonging to Scott Kelly reverted to pre-flight conditions after he returned to Earth, but that 7% did not. The absurdity of the mistake is enough to make one wonder if someone in the universe is out there laughing at us, which seems to be the case. The NASA Hubble telescope caught a space image that certainly looks like it. Hello, my name is Plotchik. I am pleased to be here with you today. I hope you are all as excited as I am. Today I'll be talking about... In part about because NASA is usually a trustworthy DNA. organization, the major media outlets ran with their press release. An Therefore, the widespread dissemination of the information may have graduated it from a small mistake to fake news. As an example, NBC, along with many other major national news agencies, did not fact-check the story and got the facts wrong. It was 7% of his gene expression that did not return to normal, not 7% of his genes. How could such a glaring mistake been overlooked? First, NASA has only been sequencing genes since 2016. Well, that is not really an excuse considering the caliber of people working there but it may explain how its press officers did not catch it. Second, the general public and the press members were educated enough to know what a gene is but were not educated enough to know what gene expression is. If they had, it would have been corrected before reaching the public through national news. NASA astronaut, Scott Kelly, whose DNA changes are discussed, had read about the research findings in Newsweek. NASA astronauts often have either a doctorate in science or an MD or are former fighter pilots. Scott Kelly was a fighter pilot, so it was not terribly surprising that he did not have the science background to realize the genomics mistake himself. Plus, by this time, he had already retired from NASA, and may have been somewhat out of the loop when it came to news. Unfortunately, Scott Kelly believed the error written article the way it was written, and then made a post about it on Twitter. It was then liked by 13,000 people and retweeted by 4,200 people. While fake news temporarily draws attention to itself, when it undermines the purpose of an organization's mission and objectives, it can actually cost the organization its credibility. 
When it comes to misinformation about science, an organization like NASA with an entire arm dedicated to science education for the American public, even a small mistake that goes left unchecked for very long, cannot be excused. The press release in this case was issued in January and not corrected until March of 2018. So what is the real science NASA is hoping to achieve? The major objective, of course, was to sequence the genome of two identical twins to see what effects life in space might have on their DNA. To this end, both Scott Kelly in space and his brother on Earth had their whole genome sequenced, presumably before and after space flight, to compare their differences. A variety of changes were studied to see what effects space has on humans. For this project, there are several principal investigator, or PI, researchers who have extensive backgrounds leading teams researching a specific question. Areas of research for the twin study include human biochemistry, DNA and RNA sequences, proteome, and telomeres. Small changes can affect the larger functionality of the body, including the human epigenome, immunome, metabolome, microbiome, and cognition. As an example, Andrew Feinberg, MD, works at Johns Hopkins examining how epigenetics causes diseases like cancer, accelerated aging, and neuropsychiatric illness. His research topic is probably the closest to medical problems astronauts faced since Project Mercury. These medical problems have included elevated exposure to cancer-causing radiation, rapid bone loss similar to osteoporosis, and stress-induced psychological conditions like close confinement of extended duration like on the ISS. The pillars of creation represent a unique example of radiation in nebulae, where stars are born. Radiation in space is different than on Earth especially solar particles and galactic cosmic rays. The Earth's magnetic fields and its atmosphere protects us from these. Once they leave Earth, astronauts are exposed to these types of radiation in space. The long-term effects on human DNA, however, is not yet fully understood. Epigenetics and epigenomics are fields that seek to understand how the environment affects DNA. Environmental variables like exposure to high radiation levels can change the chemical compounds necessary to bind to the genes that regulate protein production. Damage to these switches with the instructions that turn on or off the functions of genes in our genome can result in serious health problems like cancer. Preventing damage to the epigenome on long missions to Mars and beyond is a central research question in this project. Res P53 Tumor suppressor proteins like p53 help the body fight cancer. One way to compare genomics and epigenomics is to make an analogy of a busy workplace where the genome constitutes a group of busy workers, or laborers, and the epigenome consists of the supervisors, or managers. This supervisory group is composed of methyl groups and histones that give directions. The directions can either be blunt, binary directions, do or do not do, or they can be subtle gradations of instruction. Methyl groups are blunt. Think of them as a switch that binds to a gene and says express this gene or do not express this gene. Histones are subtle. They act like a dial, turning up or down how much the gene will express itself. If the DNA winds tightly around the histones, it will express less. If DNA winds loosely around the histones it will express more. Every cell is unique with its own methylation and histone pattern. Both genomes and epigenomes contain information that is unique and can either be hereditary or can change through life. Even with identical twins, due to the changes in epigenomes, they will never be entirely identical later in life. Let us watch a short video that explains this process in greater detail. Dures P53 HTTPS colon slash slash U2 dot B slash underscore A H N J M H is not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct, but it's wordy and hard to read. It undermines the writer's message and the word choice is bland. Grammarly's cutting edge technology helps you craft compelling, understandable writing that makes an impact on your reader. Much better. Are you ready to give it a try? Installation is simple and free. Visit Grammarly.com today.
Here's a conundrum. Identical twins originate from the same DNA, so how can they turn out so different, even in traits that have a significant genetic component? For instance, why might one twin get heart disease at 55 while her sister runs marathons in perfect health? Nature versus nurture has a lot to do with it, but a deeper related answer can be found within something called epigenetics. That's the study of how DNA interacts with a multitude of smaller molecules found within cells, which can activate and deactivate genes. If you think of DNA as a recipe book, those molecules are largely what determine what gets cooked when. They aren't making any conscious choices themselves. Rather, their presence and concentration within cells makes the difference. So how does that work? Genes in DNA are expressed when they're read and transcribed into RNA, which is translated into proteins by structures called ribosomes. And proteins are much of what determines a cell's characteristics and function. Epigenetic changes can boost or interfere with the transcription of specific genes. The most common way interference happens is that DNA, or the proteins it's wrapped around, gets labeled with small chemical tags. The set of all of the chemical tags that are attached to the genome of a given cell is called the epigenome. Some of these, like a methyl group, inhibit gene expression by derailing the cellular transcription machinery or causing the DNA to coil more tightly, making it inaccessible. The gene is still there, but it's silent. Boosting transcription is essentially the opposite. Some chemical tags will unwind the DNA, making it easier to transcribe, which ramps up production of the associated protein. Epigenetic changes can survive cell division, which means that they could affect an organism for its entire life. Sometimes that's a good thing. Epigenetic changes are part of normal development. The cells in an embryo start with one master genome. As the cells divide, some genes are activated and others inhibited. Over time, through this epigenetic reprogramming, some cells develop into heart cells and others into liver cells. Each of the approximately 200 cell types in your body has essentially the same genome, but its own distinct epigenome. The epigenome also mediates a lifelong dialogue between genes and the environment. The chemical tags that turn genes on and off can be influenced by factors including diet, chemical exposure, and medication. The resulting epigenetic changes can eventually lead to disease if, for example, they turn off a gene that makes a tumor suppressing protein. Environmentally induced epigenetic changes are part of the reason why genetically identical twins can grow up to have very different lives. As twins get older, their epigenomes diverge, affecting the way they age and their susceptibility to disease. Even social experiences can cause epigenetic changes. In one famous experiment, when mother rats weren't attentive enough to their pups, genes in the babies that helped them manage stress were methylated and turned off. And it might not stop with that generation. Most epigenetic marks are erased when egg and sperm cells are formed. But now, researchers think that some of those imprints survive, passing those epigenetic traits on to the next generation. Your mother's or your father's experiences as a child, or choices as adults, could actually shape your own epigenome. But even though epigenetic changes are sticky, they're not necessarily permanent. A balanced lifestyle that includes a healthy diet exercise, and avoiding exposure to contaminants may, in the long run, create a healthy epigenome. It's an exciting time to be studying this. Scientists are just beginning to understand how epigenetics could explain mechanisms of human development and aging, as well as the origins of cancer, heart disease, mental illness, addiction, and many other conditions. Meanwhile, New genome editing techniques are making it much easier to identify which epigenetic changes really matter for health and disease. Once we understand how our epigenome influences us, we might be able to influence it, too.
Here is the fellow that proposed the concept of the space gene. According to Dr. Christopher Mason, the most important part of this work is that it can lay the foundation for a better understanding of the risk factors to all future astronauts. It is helping today to provide, what he calls a road map for how to avoid or address these risks on missions to Mars and beyond. One plan for our journey to Mars includes the construction of a Mars Orbiting Science Laboratory and Habitat, similar to the ISS that orbits around the Earth. Telomeres are the protective caps on the ends of chromosomes. You shop on Telomeres are longer in young Transcription people. Transcription is t-shirt and, and time-consuming. After Scott spent over a year in space, his telomeres lengthened compared to those of his brother but then shortened again after he returned home. Research by Susan Bailey may help explain why this occurred. In conclusion, I discussed several possible reasons to explain fake news that emanated from a usually trustworthy source of information, NASA. The example shows that no organization is infallible and that they need to do more to prevent unintentional errors from blooming into fake news. A few key takeaways should be that as a goal we need to take steps to ensure that science communication remains true to science facts. We need to improve science education in America so that editors as well as the general public can spot errors and prevent being misled through the use of their own knowledge and sound judgment. We need to create tools that can spot and flag fake news to be removed from the Internet and to ensure that retractions are printed when needed. Additional tools could also be created like an automated reading companion to seamlessly research complex information by integrating reliable resources into web browsers and mobile apps. Readers might then be able to quickly and easily check facts and definitions when complex ideas and unfamiliar terms are being described to them. Additionally, publications aimed at popular audiences are often oversimplified. Therefore, they might also benefit from guided direction to academic papers for additional insights and detailed explanations. To that end, Ask Plutchik is going to eventually evolve into a mobile web app following its development in Second Life. What other ideas can you come up with to help prevent fake news? Please write your answer in local chat. Thank you so much for attending. Okay, and so she ends with a flourish in the I hope you have off. enjoyed this digital arts online and in virtual worlds presentation today in library land. In the remaining time you can have a Q&A with me about medical and biomedical information. I usually do well on definitions and searching databases. Thanks, Nora. And Pluchik thanks you also. <laughs> so, um, again, as it was mentioned in the uh, at the end of the presentation, um, working towards um, trying to make this into a mobile app so that uh, the brains from Fluchik at least will be uh, platform. A gentle, I'm not familiar with the, the reporter's environmental handbook. Um, how would that relate to uh, genetics and epigenetics? What kind of a um, handbook is it? So I think we should be okay. If you want to ask the bot questions and just sort of uh, do any sort of Q&A with the bot, um, you can feel free to do that for the remaining time. Hopefully, I don't think she'll crash at this point because the presentation is over with.
Was there any hypothesis or theory as to offered as to why the telomeres extended in, on um, test subjects extended in space and why they shrank on the ground? That was um, that was one of the things that that was released with the um, basically what happened was there was a lot of NASA press releases that went out about the initial results from the study, and then the formal results aren't weren't supposed to be published until later. And I haven't actually checked. Um, but, uh, you know, as to why, I mean, the, the general answer is the microgravity environment supposedly cause of those two. two. And um, what was determined was that it only lasted like a few days, I believe. Then everything went back to normal, supposedly. So that that change only occurred like while they were in space. So it wasn't like you could just go up into space and um, live up there and then look younger forever <laughs> or something, <laughs> which would be nice. I mean, that would be sort of the sci-fi interpretation of the scientific results <laughs> if you want to sort of take it out to its full extent. You know, we could live up in space. And I think there was one movie where someone was with Jodie Foster contact where someone was living up uh, up on an airplane up really high or, or in space or something. Uh, they were doing this because of the medical benefits of supposedly they were going to live longer. Uh, so, um, you know, again, this is all still really, um, the results are very new, relatively speaking, and um, again, they haven't been duplicated at all yet, and thought that the twin studies would help provide some information just like other twin studies work well in scientific scenarios. Um, and so they just happen to have twins, astronauts, wanted to do this type of twin study from that scientific. Um, so to answer your question, I don't think they know anything beyond it was in microgravity conditions um, that specifically caused the telomere change. That's their fundamental argument, that microgravity changes you at a genetic level. That's, I think, well, it's interesting because I've never heard of that happening before. The microgravity had any effect on genetic anything. Well, the, part of the reason you haven't heard about it is because NASA wasn't doing genetic testing. <laughs> um, so this was actually like we saw in that first video where they were using the, the little pipette type thing to, you know, do the the DNA sequencing in space, they actually had to create a special tool um, to be able to be certified and all of that to fly up in space and to use that for the genetic testing and that wasn't approved until recently. So this is some of the first genetic testing that is being done. There was there was some early done, but it's only been very recently. If you several paper articles, I think there was some sort of sequencing work. It might have been with plants or something, I can't recall, but it was a couple of years ago. And that's when they tested that min-ion tool. Min-ion tool was the tool that is like a handheld genetic sequencing device. And that um, that's only become available fairly recently. So even though astronauts have been going up in space for a very long time, the space testing of their genome is a new phenomenon. Now they could go up into space, have their genes tested before they went into space, then go up into space and come back down again and then have their genome tested again later. But again, these results were supposed to show like what was actually happening while they were in space. So their and as I mentioned, the changes reverted back to normal after just a few days. So even if they came back to Earth, they did a couple of days before I took testing their sequence. It would have turned out that um, those changes wouldn't have been noticed in the sequencing, most probably because of the short duration of time that it actually changed the genome. And we saw things like this happening before with, um, in terms of the bone loss, and that is that unlike you know, osteoporosis bone loss that's due to age, the astronaut's bone loss is a temp temporary phenomenon that your body can 
sort of recuperate from that after t over time. So um, there's a lot of temporary um, effects that happen to the body when the microgravity that we've learned about. Yeah, I've heard about deteriorations. This one's kind of interesting because it seems like, a, a, you know, an improvement. So that's kind of taking me aback. But okay, you answered my question. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sort of scrolling here. I'm scrolling back in the chat to see what the questions are. So. Okay, so um, definitely it's going to be an improvement, just to comment again on what you're saying. Uh, uh, and the, I think the idea is to be prepared for the trips to Mars, the manned mission to Mars is coming up. Um, and they're going to definitely want to watch for any sort of radiation changes that are happening um, in the astronauts that go to Mars. And so they're going to want to be doing this genetic testing. They're going to be wanting look for, for any problems because radiation, exposure to radiation cause breaks. So um, I'm not an expert on that, of course, but um, radiation damage is, is something that could body. So um, I think they're, they're trying to get this ready so that go on long-term missions to Mars, for example, that they'll be able to regularly have updates as to any problems that are starting. Um, yeah, sure. So if you'd like to go ahead and ask the bot, let me see if we're close enough to even ask the bot things, because um, we're going to be because the bot's kind of far away um, presentation. But so you have to say the bot's name and spell it correctly in chat. Um, The oxyribonucleic acid, the code of life. So you can basically ask it questions about uh, medical things or um, codes. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the codes because you guys aren't medical people, but <laughs> probably boring to you. But um, you can ask it sort of medical questions or just general questions. It can be a general chatbot as well as being. Um, now, if it gives a kind of a difficult answer, Answer that doesn't make a lot of sense. Then it's something I still have to. Are you a student? <laughs> yes, um, it Rihanna. It does have. Am some I a librarian? Of, of course I am. <laughs> um, it does have some of the general Eliza responses because that's what the core of it was, and then I built on top of that. Ah, you are quite welcome. Your purpose is presenting to us. <laughs> Not exactly, but... Are we still talking about, are we still talking about something? <laughs> so... <laughs> she doesn't give away free cars, unfortunately. <laughs> I could load her with a, a plane and have her rest planes that people could fly. Everything is going <laughs> extremely well. I could give that away, potentially. Yeah, I don't think she knows the best treatments. Um, she knows mostly a lot of terms right now, and she knows... Um, uh, some general facts 
Um, and in, in terms of the general medical chatbot stuff, she's not going to be able to answer the, that, the question that's real general, like purpose of life or what, how do you treat Alzheimer's? Um, because again, the bot is supposed to be geared towards like medical professionals. So that like, you would have to ask it to search a database. So you could say like blue check, search PubMed for um, breast cancer. What do you really want to ask me? Oops, I forgot to spell their name wrong. Typo. <laughs> https colon slash slash utils dot ncb dot nlm dot nih dot gov slash entry slash utils slash search dot fcc db equals pub and term equals breast cancer and this one shows like all of the tags and everything associated with the, the web page um the other way to bring up information is to actually just bring up the whole web page um and then let me see if i can pull up the video promised but she can search the different web websites I'm getting a, a little bit of lag here on my computer for websites um what she does is um there's a there, it's written in AIML, and so essentially I have the AIML set up like Pluchik search, um, and then the name of the database for, and then a wildcard. And so, like you, you have to say like the exact thing like Pluchik search the name of the database for, and then the wildcard, um, whatever the wildcard is, breast cancer or AIDS or you know, whatever you want her to look up. So she'll do the automatic searching. And then what happens is, is that that page shows up on the board and then you can interact with that page. So let me see if I can find another example. I'm using the codes. Remember the code off the top of my head. <laughs> it's in the video though. https colon slash slash utils dot ncb dot nln dot nih dot gov slash entry slash utils slash and search dot fcg db equals pub and term equals cfs so um, right now the phrase fluchik search pubmed 4 is going to yield these xml pages so let me see if I can pull up the correct phraseology for searching for so it shows the actual web page as it would display in your web browser normally. My computer is running really slow on my browser.
thanks for having me. And I'll, I'll post the links shortly. I'm, my computer browser is running a little bit slow, so. Um. But. <laughs>